green light, green light. Where, where we are. Where, where, no, no. I never can tell where you see when we're actually It's rolling. that top green light that, that in the top. Yeah, when that turns green. We are live right now. We're talking. Right, and well, and right, Thomas right is here. <laughs> all right, welcome, everybody. It's been a little bit. Yeah. Uh, like... Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, behind the scenes, like my my tank, my 360 in my house is like slowing down. It's like holiday season. It was Hard like to Black find Friday. To work. I, so we're gonna get back to that soon. Uh, but today, man, I want to join uh, like a brand new, different live. Then we're just gonna talk uh, reefing. We've got a few things we're gonna talk about, like uh, you know the differences a little bit between new tanks and old tanks. And we yeah. got uh, Thomas Burton here. Hey. Right? So if you know who Tom Burton is, raise your hand because it's uh, awesome, man. So like uh, he uh, did Big Al's channel up in Canada, mm -hmm. does a lot of aquatics up there. Uh, recently now does the uh, Natural Aquaria uh, channel on YouTube. Yeah, so channel go check website. out that for sure. It's in the de yeah, it's in the description. Link to the uh, YouTube channel. Yeah, and so uh, we're just going to talk about a little bit about what you do, what you don't do, uh, like uh, professionally, like with YouTube, it's kind of cool, uh, your reef tanks and stuff, man, sure. and we'll get into that topic in a little bit about like the difference, difference. between old tanks and whatever. So uh, I think, man, Randy, we'll just start by like, where do we know Thomas from, from man? I'll let uh, you start. I found him on YouTube. Uh, I was, <laughs> I, 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 you, you look up a lot of uh, key search words on YouTube, like how to, uh, uh, how to, adjust your thermostat or how to pick the right gravel or you know there's these keywords all over For the place sure. so i think i was looking at um how to calibrate like an jaeger eheim heater or something or how to calibrate a heater and uh one of the big owls pets uh you your face pops up here in this video right and, I, and i'm watching and i was like man this guy's like super entertaining so <laughs> i watch uh tech uh, tech tips by uh, Linus. Linus. Yeah, and uh, that's who I equated you with. You know, the the personality, your delivery was like, this guy's like Linus. <laughs> is, mannerisms, characteristics is awesome. So then I was addicted and watching a bunch of your videos. So. Awesome. Yeah, that's big fan. Super flattering. Big. So I got about the same story. So I won't bore you with the whole thing. <laughs> like uh, for me. Uh, I watch, you know, I like to see what everybody's doing. So I go mm -hmm. watch, and I don't always watch the whole thing, man, but like I try to like see what people are doing, why they're doing it, and how they're doing it. And for me, like one of the only ones, man, that can watch the whole thing is your material. Because uh, <laughs> you just carry it. I'm like, doing something right. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. And so I watch this whole thing, and I'm like, man, this guy has got like a personality. I like it. Wow. You can watch the whole thing. And Off he reminds the cuff, too. me, I don't, know, I don't know if you guys uh, uh, watch this channel, but Revzilla. You remind me of oh, Redzilla. Yeah. So this oh, guy yeah. comes in on that one and he's like, Welcome to Rizilla, design and ride. And he's got like energy. <laughs> and, like, I, and I'm like, oh man, this is this guy's like right in there, you know? Yeah. And so for me also, you know, kind of finds that uh, like, you know, in between of watching me and all my little information coming out, I'm putting you to sleep. It's just mm. so boring. Uh, and then uh, other guys like running around with their fish tank squirting guns at each other, uh, which is like yeah. not really thing. Right, you're right in the middle of that, man. You're keeping it fun, getting the information going. So <laughs> I, I'm super excited to have you here. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. I've been a massive fan of uh, Ball Crease Supply's channel forever. Uh, I've, I've, you know, used you guys to uh, educate myself whenever there's a new product or a new topic or something that I haven't been able to personally dive into. You guys do an amazing job of getting that information out there mm. in a practical way that people can absorb. Uh, and it's it's super dense, the amount of information, but <laughs> it's super concise and clear. And yeah, so I'm a huge fan of you guys. It's, it's a, a really fun situation where you're fans of your fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a mutual, yeah. So a yeah, lot of people say they watch cool. our stuff wherever. We were like, uh, I went out for like some fish and chips last night, and uh, I, like it was really clear because he was like reciting some of our videos back at me. And I'm like, oh, you must really actually watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> All right, right on. So if you have any questions for any of us uh, throughout this, man, just pile them up. A yeah. lot of what we're talking about is like, you know, we just did this like five minute tank guide, you know, and it was really about that first year of reefing and getting mm -hmm. past the hardest part. And so later on, we'll talk a little bit about like you know water changes or maintenance, lighting, cycling a tank, refugiums, filter sucks. Like, how do you treat it a little different like after year one than you've, in that first important year? So we'll hit on that a little bit. You got questions for us? Let them pour in. Uh, yeah. You got any questions just personal for uh, uh, Thomas here, like his favorite taco or whatever? Feel free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so tell us maybe like uh, a little bit about your reefing journey when you started your first tank and uh, where sure. it landed you. And Dave's got some pictures of it he'll share with you along the way as well. Yeah, so from the website. Ahead. Awesome. So I started reefing probably about 16 years ago. So I've been doing it mm. for a while. I'm not an old guy, but I started when I was really young. So um, my very first tank, I remember it was uh, like an Eclipse system oh, okay. with just some yeah. fluorescent tubes mm -hmm. and I had some soft curls in there. 
That very quickly turned into a 65 gallon with 400 watt halides. Mm. That's a big jump, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, from there, I, I kind of fell in love with, I guess, nano reefing right away. So my tank right after that was a 20 gallon. Oh, you with, downsized. Yeah, yeah, way more light on it than I could have ever thought I could put on a tank. <laughs> 12 inch tall, 20 gallon, 16 inches front to back. And I had like a 250 and a 175 halide and some VHOs all staggered nicely with different spectrum bulbs. And from there. Uh, oh, hold up, hold up. So not a traditional a 20. This one? No, oh, I wish one. I still, this is, oh, like, we're phone. talking, this was like 19, uh, or sorry, 1999, 2001, 2002. This is like pre-digital camera. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. This is I, one, like, my first my webcam. My cell phone, yeah. yeah, I didn't have anything. This is my first, I was using a webcam that gave me, like, resolution photos oh, that were this yeah. big on my screen. Yeah. But um, after that, like, I, I started trying to play around with things a bit more, and I, I heard for the longest time, you can't run a canister filter on a reef. So... I did a 20 gallon, which is uh, actually on the Natural Vivaria website. And it was an SPS reef, I had clams in it, and uh, it ran on a canister filter. No skimmer, mm. no fuge, just five gallon weekly water changes and uh, some Ecotech lighting, Ecotech pumps. And I had SPS grow in that tank at a, a really decent rate. I had an auto dosing system I stuck on at one point yeah. because it gets super tedious doing oh, it by yeah. hand when the consumption rate is so high. Were you doing two part or Kalkwasser or what um, were you dosing? So I was dosing uh, on that tank. That one was actually probably one of the more recent tanks. Um, and it was right after the Aqua Vitro line of products mm -hmm. came out. So I was using Aqua Vitro on that tank. Um, I've used Seacom products for a really long mm -hmm. time. So. But yeah, so that tank was a really fun experiment. I had a 40 gallon breeder that I did was probably the first big build, not big tank, but big build, where I had no pumps, tons of plumbing. I was really trying hard. Oh, so I, you drilled it, you added some, everything. So you yeah. did the whole nine. Went yeah. crazy, and I, I know you've just done a 40 gallon uh, yeah. recently. I did, it for me, for the most part, there's some situations where I go different, but for me, 40 gallon breeder, then 120. Yeah, like all the rest of them in between, I, I'm, I like. I don't. Have, sometimes it's sixty cubes. I like, but yeah. uh, that's pretty much what I did. I had a forty gallon breeder. I would made a like a mid step at like sixty gallon tall, and then two months after that was in one hundred and twenty five. Yeah. So well, I, I like the ninety cube too. So the mm -hmm. ninety three cube. So the cubes have a little place in my heart as well. But if it's a rectangular shape, it's forty breeder then one twenty. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. that form factor just really like the reason I really loved it is it lends so well to aquascaping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So one of the things I wanted to hit on real quick is you're talking about that 20-gallon that uh, tank, like, you know, you had success with, and sure. all you did is, like, a canister filter. Uh, yeah. and, like, so really the canister filter is probably running carbon, and it's, like, acting like a filter sock and doing all the normal things mm -hmm. a little filter does. I, I always tell people all the time, man, like, you can put hang-on gear on your little 20-gallon tank if you want, mm -hmm. or you can just do weekly 5-gallon water change on it, right? And if you do that... It's 25% just as good and way cheaper done. and yeah. way less ugly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like uh, in fact, like and even in that case, like when you hard plumb the or not hard plumb, but when you create like a closed loop with your canister filter to get all the benefits out of that, it's just two little pipes that come over the edge, right? Yeah, and it's not like all this gear hanging all over the place. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot more minimalistic. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do that. I even attached just a surface skimmer just to. I, I like overflow systems because they get rid of that slick yep. at the top of the water. Yep. I didn't want that, so I threw that little surface skimmer on there, and it, it did a, pre a pretty decent job. I also didn't run it with the standard media. I just took two coarse foam sponges and just bio media, and that was it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? I, I didn't want it to bog up. I didn't want to have, like, filter floss that was constantly getting... So I just did the maintenance, five gallons once a week, gravel, gravel clean the uh, substrate, and... Mm -hmm. You can have a tank that's just... A one five gallon bucket water change That's is so all you need to do. Yes. Like that is when it's actually the easiest and cheapest way to be successful. Oh yeah, I, and I, I mean you can and you can achieve some of those iconic, awesome looking tanks. Like you can have a wall, wall to wall SPS twenty. It's cheaper to do a wall to wall SPS twenty than a hundred and twenty or three hundred and sixty oh, gallon SPS. You know, all uh, dominant system, but. I mean, you can still make those tiny little tanks look awesome. Yeah. So yeah, that was one of the things, man, you hit on actually last night was that uh, like uh, uh, those tiny little tanks like come into their own so much faster, way mm. faster. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. like to fill out a 120 or a 360 or whatever, man, your little frag looks like a little frag 
here, here, here. Only like when it gets to this, does it not look like a frag anymore? Yeah, it's right? like the one. We were we were talking before the live stream. The one sixty. We remember when it looks like frags. We're coming up on three years from the wow. time that we put frags in that thing. Three plus years oh, yeah. from the times yeah. that we put frags in that thing till now. It looked like this. I, yeah. So sometimes serious, I don't want to wait. Seriously, <laughs> nice colonies. Yeah. And so you know, it ebbs and flows in there too. But yeah. if you got a like, twenty gallon tank, you know, like. The little frag gets to here, and it looks like a colony now. Yeah. Right? Uh, <laughs> yeah so like a true. totally different thing. So especially if you're like a newer reefer, uh, or even like you can see why you know a lot of even like pro reefers are doing this like in their office or whatnot. Like I, I don't want to have an ugly tank in my office mm. for the next two years, right? I just want to have a nice little one that's easy to maintain yeah. and looks awesome, and it's super easy to make them look awesome when uh, really quickly. Yeah. What when there's that's the key thing, like when, and that's why I like nano reefing so much, is because you can get that um, end result that you wanted. That that doing in a large tank takes a few years to do. You can do that within eight months, usually with an SPS tank and like a twenty gallon form factor. Within eight months, your frags actually look like small colonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, and if you're really into the fragging and gardening aspect of the hobby as well, where you want to yeah. be able to go in there and trim and you know keep those corals small and grow new corals and trade them or sell them or whatever it is you want to do. Having that small system really lends to that. You get to start doing that a lot sooner. You don't feel so bad mm. chopping your like your first branch that came off of your you know <laughs> Walt Disney Acropora Tenius whatever, mm -hmm. uh, because you know it's already a decent size for that size system. So that, that always really appealed to I me. I think as it's well. funny how the larger the conversation in you know for beginners majority is like you know solve it with solve all your problems with dilution. Go bigger. The bigger you are, the happier you're going to be. Um, I mean, there's probably a good, there's probably a path for a beginner, like something that somebody can point at and go, all right, you can really get there a lot quicker, and you can probably do it there and be as successful in a 20 gallon tank. These are the five, six, 10 steps that you need to uh, make sure that you don't turn into an algae farm, and you don't have to use a large tank to get there. You know, right. Part of it is just like achieving the dream, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, like, if I'm gonna start my first tank, like, you know, if I go out and like tr try to fly, like I got into a radio control helicopter or something, right? right? Like I actually need to be able to take off and land on the ground, you know, before this will ever become a hobby. <laughs> so if, if you ever, if you like, if you give me a drone, man, I'll go out there and have fun with it, like today. Yeah. Right. And right. I'll land it. Crash the hell today. out of it. Yeah. But if you give me like an actual helicopter. Uh, I will crash it so many times that I throw the thing and give up today. I'll be done. <laughs> In fact, I went to a hobby shop. I wanted to get into helicopters, yeah. and uh, like I tried to use their little like uh, like uh, simulator. You know, I sat there for like six hours trying to land. And whatever. And I'm like, this is not for me. <laughs> uh, I knew for sure. So yeah, like so if you got a reef tank, man, getting a twenty gallon tank. And you know, in your 20 gallon tank, if you can realize a dream like a 20 gallon Nuvo or like one of those like uh, nanos from like Red Sea or just mm -hmm. 20 long even, yeah. uh, if you can achieve that and get the dream uh, with all the little frags, like, ah, oh, I know what I'm trying to do now. And I yeah. achieved it in less than a year. I just don't think in your first tank you're willing to wait three years I wasn't. You know, to achieve the dream. That's I wasn't willing to wait the month or two months for the thing to cycle before I wanted to start <laughs> adding you know, a bunch of stuff to it. So yeah, I'm yeah. definitely not a year patient as a brand new reefer. Yeah. So hey, let's just see a couple of his tanks. If you can go to his website, so uh, Natural Aquaria. Uh, there you go. So uh, there you go, man. Like we had some, uh, it was on the home tab. So this is the home, and then we're going to the work tab, the which work. has yeah. some of the stuff you've done. work that I have done. So that's that 20-gallon uh, SPS reef that I did oh, yeah. um, that was running on a canister filter. So I also had clams. I love using clams for nutrient export, too. I'm a massive fan of clams. Yeah. I desperately want to create a clam, clam refugium. refugium. <laughs> yeah. Do it! Uh, do it! Uh, I, yeah. I fully agree. A display clam refugium. I just really want to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, so these look awesome, man. Yeah, uh, so, can you scroll through this a little bit more or no? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, I even had soft corals in there. Mm -hmm. um, that's that 40 gallon breeder that I did. Um, again, a lot of success. Uh, some corals were still getting used to it. I wasn't as good at testing and dosing back then. Mm -hmm. So this tank was probably in 2004, 2005. What lights, is on, what lights are on those? So I started off Metal on this halides? tank with uh, three halides. Okay. They're two 250s and one uh, 150 and a couple of um, T5 uh, actinics. But mm -hmm. I actually ended up switching over to six bulb of high output T5 and that okay. was it. So this is about the same time that I started my first tank. Really? Yeah, 2004, awesome. I think it was. 
Uh, and so I also, well, I started with PC bulbs, but quickly went over to uh, a tech mm -hmm. T5 fixture. Yeah, T5, awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, all right, we've got a few more in there? Yeah. Um, so that was a Solana back in the day that uh, I did as well. That one was running off of just a halide. I had some nice crochet clams and stuff in there. Just, I like to collect a whole bunch of stuff, so clams, zoanthids, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That tank was a little bit more recent. It was an SPS system I did. I probably did that one back in 2000 and maybe 2009, 2010. Geeked out on the gear, I see, on yeah. that one. And so. then I, I did some planted stuff as well. I do fresh water and salt water, so. so I had a little bit of fun with some small fresh water tanks and uh, yeah, just well, experimented. So from that Pico you were saying you're into dart frogs as well? Yeah, so I also oh, do some artificial displays <laughs> just for fun, right? Just for practice. <laughs> but uh, This is what it could look like. Yeah, just, just aquascaping, just having some fun tank makeovers and stuff like that. That was my uncle's tank. He bought a house that had a built-in tank in the wall, and he wanted a reef but couldn't take care of one, so I got him an African cichlid tank that looked like a reef instead. But those are... Yeah, so those are my 10-gallon vertical uh, dart frog tanks. I was breeding um, various types of dart frogs. I find there's a huge kind of crossover in uh, keeping dart frog vivariums mm -hmm. um, uh, as keeping reef aquariums. There's oh, yeah. so, it's, so many dynamics it's that are similar. It's massively, uh, and you'll find reef tanks in those same houses. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So there's a local guy here that has, like, I'm going to butcher this the size there, but I believe it was 15 feet long tank that was, like, 6 feet tall by, like, 3 or 4 feet deep, right? And uh, he ended up like getting a job down in Costa Rica where he had to go do some construction, so he couldn't take care of the reef tank. It had like mm -hmm. stingrays in it, and like, but it was all full reef. Like, there were so many, and he had all kinds of predator fish that eat coral, but he grew more coral than the fish could eat. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, so it yeah. Was, like it was really cool. Uh, but he eventually couldn't take care of it. It was like the kind of tank you had to build the house around too. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But he turned it into a terrarium. You know, just filled with dart frogs and stuff. Like, so 15 feet of dart frogs. And Even stuff. better. That's, yeah. incredible. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, really cool. So we were talking actually last night a little bit about that. Like, you know, the natural thought is that, like, people gravitate, you know, from freshwater to saltwater. Mm. I think some people do do that, you know. But, like, I think that it's the fact that, like, saltwater is so hard and yeah. rare and cool. And it kind of attracts a different kind of crowd a lot many times. It's like, so dart frogs and stuff, like rare and cool and different, you know, like it's yeah. just not super common, mm -hmm. you know? No. Uh, and so I'm not surprised to see that those things kind of uh, gravitate towards each other. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting because it, on so many levels, it's the same. It's a, a complete ecosystem that we're trying to recreate. Um, there's a lot of collectability in the plants, just like there's collectability in corals, there's fragging, mm -hmm. you know, you're trimming those plants, getting cuttings. Uh, the frogs are, very, very similarly colored to a lot of the fish. I actually have a blog on that Natural Aquaria website too that has a lot of those visuals that compares dart frogs and, and the fish and the plants and the corals and so on and so forth. And it's just really crazy how many parallels there are that and it just feels the same. It feels the same, but it's so much faster to <laughs> set faster. up a vivarium and have it look completely yeah. full of plants and grown in yeah. in a short period of time and breeding dart frogs a little bit easier than breeding saltwater fish, I would say. Yeah. But still that, like, there's this prestige about it that it just, you feel so good when you manage to accomplish those things. <laughs> and yeah, so for me, they're, they're on the same playing field for sure. Right on, man. Well, uh, so like, tell us a little bit about how you got into uh, YouTube and video. Like, I, I'm not I sure. I see a lot of comments out. who uh, some of them are saying they started because of you. Oh, very cool. Yeah, yeah, that right makes on, me man. so happy. So, uh, and <laughs> some that have like seen all of your work, I, I'm just kind of like browsing comments here casually. But. That's so awesome. So, uh, sorry. What year was your your channel started? Ah, uh, we started um, the Big Owls VOD channel started five years ago. Okay. So I'm bad at math. 2014. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it started five years ago. Uh, basically, I'd been working for for Al, like for I don't know, 14 years at the time, mm -hmm. 13, 14 years. So, and they approached me. They know I'm a little bit of an eccentric guy. You know, <laughs> I got a sense of humor on me, uh, and I, I, they know that I love the hobby. And I'm I was, you know, competent enough in explaining myself to customers over the phone. I worked in their online department or even in store that I could get the, the message across in a way that people were finding uh, pretty Light easy to absorb. Were going yeah, off. exactly. Yeah. So they said, hey, how do you feel about uh, you know, doing this channel? And I was a little apprehensive at first because I, I wasn't my goal to be on a channel and be in everybody's face. But um, You said you had done uh, high school theater and that was yeah. about 
as classically trained as you were. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I did high school drama class. Yeah. That's that's about all I did. Randy was too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and he oh, came yeah. in nice. right away. He's like, uh, lion face, lemon face. Lion face. <laughs> like, classically trained. I stole yes. that from a movie, but yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So yeah, just uh, just started with I think the very first e uh, video we did was either setting up an Eheim twenty two seventeen because mm -hmm. Eheim canister filters, especially the classic series, have horrible instructions. Oh yeah, and uh, we wanted to solve that problem because a lot of you out there who have those filters or bought those filters were like, "What? Well, I can't read this. Yeah. This makes no sense." So yeah. we started there. Uh, I did like a Marineland hang on filter setup and review, and then just it just kept going. I think the very first like seriously popular video mm -hmm. that I did where I started to feel like, okay, I think I know what I'm doing was how to make a, a natural looking aquarium oh. using plastic plants. Okay, mm. I bet that Which one it, took off. It did, yeah. that, was, oh, that was one of the first ones. I was like, okay, let's do this. So uh, yeah, from there on, we just kept making new content, different things, different subjects. And the whole goal for me was just to uh, educate, entertain, and get as many people who are in the hobby to stay in it because when people don't have success, they don't find success, they get frustrated and that's the last we ever see of them. And uh, get new people who might not be interested all the way but yeah. are on the fence, show them that this is easy and possible, you know, especially in the freshwater world. And that if you want a challenge and you want to take things to the next level, if you want to have that, you know, prestigious looking reef aquarium, that that's also possible. Mind you, I think you guys, like absolutely nail it in the information category for reef keeping. Like I don't think there's a, a better place. Don't don't get me wrong. I'll try to teach you everything <laughs> I can, right? But uh, there's there's just something uh, about the amount of information that you can pack into a single video and mm. the amount of testing you guys do that so that we, because I watch your videos too, so we don't have to do that stuff. And it just really spoke to me. So well, mm. thanks for the but, kind yeah. words. Uh, I will tell you, like most of the success we just stumble into. I have, I have no idea. <laughs> Big bright so, idea. Uh, like. In hindsight, I can tell you for sure, there was nobody waiting around for somebody to sell more pumps or skimmers. Uh, like yeah. That was not. They don't like, need another store. You know, no, nobody cares. Yeah. Uh, but turns out, man, the demand was for information, right? There's so little information. On such a uh, complex hobby. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. And, and like so much, you know, advice to sort through, right? And mm -hmm. so like the demand actually, you know, we filled the, we created the channel, like I guess ours was like 2008. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was actually like, first like how do you use two-part like now it's like everybody knows right? uh, <laughs> yeah. but back then it was not yeah. that way and so uh you know it's just a, a total different thing so yeah information uh is like super super fun and for me you know when you're like you know we're you know business owners here too like uh, you know you're like there's other people out there like trying to carve up the market you know like you know yeah you know, try to get that skimmer sale or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah i don't know so for me man like the best way you know, if you want to be successful is help people achieve their dreams, right? Absolutely. And mm -hmm. so if people fail, they're done. Yeah. Right? If they're successful, like, and you have, instead of having a one-year tank, you have two or three or four, man, that is the best thing for all of us, right? And so yeah. I see that you are doing that. The same, it's interesting to hear that same story out of you and yeah. what you're doing there is helping people be successful and grow uh, their tanks, man. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. It's like, just great for everyone. So then talk to us about uh, the natural aquaria. Like, I went and I looked at it for the first time this morning. Sure. I subscribed Bulk Reef Supply to it. Yes! And, uh, but what do you guys, what, what's your intent there? What are you guys doing there? So um, basically, uh, Brian and I just decided, you know, we're going to start a new home uh, for, for our video content. Yeah. And we want to keep doing what we love doing. So um, we took what was my personal channel. It used to be like youtube.com slash Thomas B or whatever, mm -hmm. where I was just having fun and showing like my personal stuff that I do on my own time. and. We uh, rebranded it with uh, Natural Aquaria, which is a blog I had started a number of years ago. Again, just to get my ideas out there, just to have some fun. And we're just going to do what, we, uh, what we've been doing. So we're just going to create educational, fun content, show mm. people. Now, the cool thing is Brian, who's the, my video producer and editor, right? Um, he does not do aquariums. <laughs> he's completely new. In fact, for five years, he's completely avoided having an aquarium, and I've bugged him about it, and our, our subscribers had bugged him about it. Yeah. He finally decided he's going to start keeping tanks. So we've got his perspective on there, where he's literally just went, I think the first uh, video that he's posted is him uh, getting a tank full of guppies he got on on like a local mm. classified ad mm. and him setting that up So he finally has his first tank. Yeah, and I'll graduate him up to reefing at some point We'll, we'll get Brian into reefing, but so, so we got him on one end of the spectrum and then me on the other 
who has the experience and wants to do more complex stuff. Dave, uh, who's on the other side of the camera here, I actually had one of the nicer tanks here. So yeah, he never had an aquarium. Little five gallon. Uh, Good job. Yeah. Yeah. You've probably gallon seen tank. it in a bunch <laughs> of gallon. videos. Mm -hmm. A little eight gallon. Uh, it's an innovative, innovative marine eight. Innovative yeah. marine, nice. you know, with a little incorporated back. Yeah. And uh, dude, it was super, it was super really nice. nice and I can't remember, like, I know you must have just got busy, but do you, what, how come it came, came down? I had to move desks. Oh, crashed it. Uh, yeah. Moving tanks, Had the man, Castle is tough. Uh, yeah, uh, dude, it's always such a major setback. So uh, then people are talking about, and I'm, I'm just picking out random comments here about these. They love your reaction videos or something yeah. you do. Is this something on the new channel too? Yeah, yeah. No, we're gonna keep doing react videos as well. So the I'm react have to go series, back and look at them. It's those. a lot of fun. You yeah. guys should do react. I haven't too. seen the react. I haven't so seen either. It? So basically, um, what we did was we just reached out to our community and said all right, subs, send us pictures of your tanks and I'll have a look at them and I'll kind of give you my feedback on the tanks, tell you oh, the things I like, maybe okay. give you some constructive criticism, so on and so forth. So yeah, we just, they and we got inundated with submissions. I think, like we started, we got handful and mm -hmm. then we had a list that was a thousand submissions long. Oh my gosh. So, so I see this, this is like something in the gaming community and, and or these other communities, like there's a YouTuber and you see their little picture down here and then they're watching a video or they're yeah. watching something happen. They're like, and they just comment on it. It's yeah. commentary. It's really cool. Oh, very neat. I didn't know, yeah, that's a good idea. One of my favorite things about doing Reacts is you get to see all of the aquariums of the people that you're kind of helping to educate or follow you. And yeah. it is incredible to see like what they're actually capable Love and, yeah. and uh, their successes. Like surpassing us. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah, like, uh, honestly, it's it's sometimes like, I'm a little intimidated. Don't know what to tell you. You're doing great. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, so sometimes, man, other people are able to follow your advice better than yourself. Uh, <laughs> Funny how that happens, yeah, eh? Yeah, but like, so very, very props <laughs> to all of you, man. Yes, absolutely. So that's super cool, man. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah. I, I'm gonna have to watch one now, like as soon as we uh, wrap the oh, yeah, show. Yeah, for right sure. Now. Yeah, yeah right they're up. they're fun. Okay, so, uh, you know, we can jump into these questions, man. Uh, we pull up a few of these questions for us, Randy. All right, uh, sure. Uh, let's see. Oh, I mean, there's just random, all kinds of random questions. Jacob Peterson <laughs> yeah. is blowing up our inbox. So, uh, Jacob asked about during the four-month cycle, uh, uh, when should you do your first water change? That's interesting. That's a good go question. So, uh, uh, for me, I'm probably doing water changes, like, throughout. But, like, small, minimal ones. So... I'll set my tank up and I just kind of get used to that rhythm, get into that, like I'm gonna change out 10 gallons and I'm gonna put 10 gallons back in. You may not be doing anything at the moment because I don't have lights on, I probably don't have fish in there, I'm not actively feeding, so I'm not maybe doing much, uh, but I get into that, that rhythm of doing it. Building so then, the habit. Yeah, it becomes a, a, like, I can build, I can get my system down to like when I have corals, when I have fish, like I know, all right, I got my, I got a 20 gallon brute trash can. I know exactly how much salt to put in there. I know what pumps I need to bring upstairs. I need to, I know I've got my tubing measured for water changing. Like a, all this is figured out from the, from the get go. Right. So I was told don't do water changes in the beginning, like forever ago, uh, because you're going to like export the bacteria and you got to let the tank cycle and stuff. Ah, and like, turns out that is garbage. <laughs> uh, like that is not true at all. Mm. Like. The bacteria lives on the surface of the rock and sand, not floating around in the water. I wouldn't be removing like largely anything. Mm. And like if you didn't do it, you are absolutely setting yourself up for the wrong maintenance cycle. Yeah. And, like, and I'm just building nitrate and phosphate up for when I'm gonna turn the lights on. Yeah. I'm just building the time bomb. Like there's yeah. no reason that you should not be doing the water changes from the beginning. Yeah. Like I can't think of one. I don't. So uh, for me, I've always, uh, I've whether it's freshwater or saltwater, I'll usually start doing water changes a couple, maybe three weeks in. I, I you know, seed it with ammonia, whatever the food source is, mm -hmm. let that do its thing with the bacteria for the first little bit, and then just right on top of those water changes mm -hmm. for the exact reason that uh, you guys are talking about. Number one, building the habit's super important because if you don't, you're just not gonna do it. Mm -hmm. If you already haven't started, you're probably not gonna start. Yeah. And then uh, making sure that when you do finally flip the switch on the lights and start adding livestock, you're not you know, already being inundated with nutrients that are just gonna fuel things that you don't wanna have happen in the first place. Mm -hmm. So no, it makes perfect sense to do water changes. Just why, just why, why are you gonna wait? Just start <laughs> doing them. Well, it's like, I mean, so there's some world where I can tell you you don't have to do it until you get nitrate levels or whatever to, to certain levels. But like with somebody's asking this question, you're probably new. Yeah, and yeah. like, so I'm not gonna uh, understand. You know, easy advice, 
is the right advice, Absolutely. right? And so do them and then get rid of the dumb conversation about yeah, the rest yeah. of it. If you're a super pro reefer and you've been doing this for 20 years, first off, you didn't ask this question. You, know, <laughs> you, right? you already know from yeah, trial so and the error. the person that's asking this question yeah. and doesn't know and is probably doing this their first rodeo, give the person with the first rodeo the right answer. Mm. This is kind of the heart of a little bit of what, like, what I, I, I've been talking about lately with a lot of people is, you know, people ask advice, like, should I do water changes? Should I change my filter stock? Should I do this or that, whatever thing? And almost everybody actually like immediately thinks to like what I'm doing and then wants to like kind of share that information. But very few think about the person that asked. Yeah. Like, yeah. And if you are thinking about the person that asked, man, count yourself amongst like uh, the best quality advice out there, right? Mm. At least you're thinking about that person, right? Mm -hmm. And so in this case, it, if I'm, you know, into this for five years and I'm not doing water changes anymore because I found the like secret sauce or whatever. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> well, that's just different than the guy that just turned the lights on for the first time. Well, so you then know? you're, yeah. and that's where uh, these new these new reefers and stuff get uh, the mixed advice is uh, they go and read the forums and they see, well, this guy has a really awesome looking tank and I want that tank, and I also see that he's not doing water changes. I'm not going to do water changes because that's the that's the path to success. It looks like. Mm -hmm. So that's so true, man. It's like you go there and you ask a question or search for it and find the an answer, and then there's 60 answers there, mm. right? And they're all different, you yeah. know? And you just don't know who to listen to, man, right? And they're, all the answers are actually based on a very specific scenario. Right? Yeah, like, a very specific set of parameters. Everybody's system is going to be built differently. You're going to have different uh, equipment on it. Different brands even can change the way that things are going to function within that system. So for all those small variables, whether or not you're using a skimmer, whether or not you have a refugium, whether or not uh, you're using um, biological filtration outside of just the rock in the aquarium, all of those things are going to change the way you have to approach that system. Mm. So picking and choosing off of a shelf of completely random aquariums that look really nice but function in very different ways uh, is just gonna add a complexity to what you're trying to do that might not be compatible. Mm -hmm. And then you end up in a situation where you're getting good advice that's bad for your situation. Mm -hmm. Not that it's necessarily bad advice, just it's not gonna work. And that's, that's where I think, it, where you nailed it, you have to think about the person asking the question and look at what they're trying to accomplish and how they're trying to accomplish it to be able to answer it effectively. So one of the things is, I, I, you know, I, it's a type of video you're producing in many cases. Like, so if i am got a video that's aimed at uh, people who've been doing this for 10 years, the quality, the type of advice is just different, yep. right? Yeah. If I got a video or a video that we're going to do that's a, aimed at people that are doing this for the first time, I enter this with this thought process. It's what's the highest percentage path to success? Yeah, mm -hmm. right? like so. Yeah, you could go and start Triton from day one, and you know, avoid water changes maybe. Right? Yeah, and get a refugium and avoid water changes maybe, or you know, you could do carbon dosings from day one, and maybe not do water changes. Right? But uh, and some people will raise their hand and say, I did that, mm -hmm. and it worked. I was awesome for me. Uh, and but even those people will openly admit that that is a lower percentage path to success uh, than just doing water changes to mm. begin with. Even the people that have succeeded at it will say, it can be done and I've done it, but yeah, it's probably not <laughs> the highest percentage percent path. So it was the easiest and it was the right one for me because my demands was I'm willing to do a lot of stuff to not carry up around buckets of water mm. or buy it or you know right. carry 50 pound buckets of salt around my house. Yeah. I'm willing to do a whole lot of stuff for myself to not do that. And I'm willing to roll the dice and take bigger chances to achieve that specific goal. Mm. But I would say most first year reefer success or goal is just I want a nice looking tank. End of story. Yeah, that's right? simple. So let's give the best, highest percentage path. Like, let's get 90% of you there, right? Or give the type of device that would achieve that. Right? Exactly. <laughs> that's my goal, personally. Uh, it's a good goal. That's basically like, even when I'm talking about freshwater tanks and all that stuff, when people ask me, uh, especially questions regarding just setting up your first freshwater tank, it's the, the advice is always, this is how you're going to do it to, to achieve success for your first time. I, once you've had that success and you've got your, your discipline and you you mm. you know you want to start experimenting more and taking things to the next level, yeah. like in the saltwater hobby, it's, I'm starting off with a soft coral reef. Now I'm going to do maybe a mixed reef, even though that's pretty hard. And then you know eventually it's just straight to SPS, whatever it is. 
fresh water is the same, you know, start with live barriers in a 10 gallon, 20 gallon tank, whatever it is, then try maybe a planted system or maybe you want to do African cichlids or more aggressive fish. It, it's important to introduce people to things that they're going to be successful with mm -hmm. and then let them figure out what path they want to take after that. And they start now that they're comfortable and they've got the base, mm -hmm. they can move on to something a little bit more difficult and yeah. fostering that kind of uh, um, uh, you know, of a community in the hobby and making sure that people are getting the right information for them so that they can have that success is critical to make sure that they not only enjoy the hobby, but they stay in it. And we want more and more people yeah. to play with, right? Yeah, exactly. We want to share and, mm -hmm. and have more aquariums and, and find new ways to do things. And you can't do that if the pool just keeps dwindling because only a certain range of people are capable of doing it with, uh, you know, the information they had access to at the time. Well, luckily, man, information in reefing has never been more available, right? It's blown yeah. up. I mean, mm -hmm. when I started, it was only books. Yep. Uh, magazines were, yeah. eh. uh, And the forums, man, definitely. But I had 4,000 posts there trying to figure out what I was going to do. So, uh, but now there's just so much information. And, like, I mean, there's if you wanted to do, if I wanted to learn how to do two-part, I actually had somebody come to my house, man, and show me personally. Wow. Right? <laughs> like, and it's such a simple thing now. Like, yeah, but, like, Back then, dude, like I'd go to the store and it was like, here's your, you know, turbo calcium every Thursday, dose it. Like, Doesn't well, it didn't help. do anything, right? <laughs> and nobody even told me about alkalinity. So mm -hmm. it yeah. wasn't the same thing that now, like, there's, it's everywhere. There's so many videos. Mm -hmm. And like, mm -hmm. when I started, YouTube didn't even exist, right? I think YouTube came in in 2005 or Too six right. or something yeah. like that. And now, you know, like, if you want to look at instructions, man, like, it's just, 40 pages of instructions. No, thanks. I can actually share with you inside of two minutes. Right? Yeah. Because in the instructions, it's like put thumb here, put other thumb here, tear, use two million. In this case, in video, you're just like, okay, we're going to tear it open like this. And you know, yeah, it's like done. totally different instead of yeah, instructions. There's no diagrams mm -hmm. or whatever. And so it's just so much easier to share information these days uh, and wrap it and, and, you know, with the event of like uh, the uh, forums now and they're like on your mobile device and, you know, Facebook groups and stuff like that. There's just information's everywhere. Right? Yeah. I do wish though, like, I, I really wish, and I, I challenge everybody out there to think about this for a minute. Next time somebody asks you a question, right? It'd be so awesome if, if the community in general, when somebody asks a question, like, to really see all of the next hundred answers, think about that person and how your knowledge can help that person rather than just kind of sharing what we've done in the past, mm -hmm. right? Which is, it's usually like 80% the other one, just sharing what worked for me. Yeah, and uh, I, this uh, hobby's riddled with anecdotal. There's an oh anecdotal my. this, this, I, I dosed this and this happened, so it means it's gonna work for you. And uh, anyway, even researching the hobby uh, has led me down that path. Like everything that you guys have tried, I'm, I'm gonna try it too, because obviously it worked for you, and fail, fail. The same thing with like, oh, like especially the advice that I got with a brand new tank and killing all nitrates and phosphates and all out war on them and while I'm trying to grow SPS and it didn't work, it doesn't work. No. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, that's something like the, the nitrate conversation. It's like, we didn't have the tools to get rid of them at one point. And now, like, we, like our tools effectively. are so strong, like, uh, you gotta get them back, back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we solved a problem to create a new one. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I don't know, so. Well, you talked about instructions, man. This is actually one of my funnier stories. Like, uh, and I don't know if it's a funnier story, but like the instructions used to be so bad when <laughs> I started the hobby, man. Like, especially the stuff that was coming out of China. But they're right? not technical writers. Yeah. So, and it had to be translated because the stuff like uh, came from China and it was written for China first, you know. And so it had, you know, been translated by somebody, mm -hmm. but not anybody that knows English actually, just barely. Mm -hmm. And like one of them was like protein skimmer uh, from Bubble Magus, actually. Sorry, Bubble Magus. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was like such broken English. And it's like, if protein skimmer not working, taste effluent, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm, uh, <laughs> do not, <laughs> do not taste the effluent. <laughs> Mm. I'm like, oh, they're telling you to put fish poop in your mouth. And granted, like, like the, probably translation is like smell or something instead of taste. But like, it just goes to show you if they can't get that right, the instructions were so bad. Mm. Like, so no, you couldn't usually use it for anything. Somebody had right. to show you how to use this, right? Absolutely. And, and in fact, today we just shot a video this morning about tuning your protein skimmer. And I'm really hoping that we can like change the like level of how we go about this because like 
at the end of this, Dave has looked at me and he's like, dude, I've never seen this explained this way before. Mm -hmm. right? I'm excited and to watch this. I, me too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know, like all the concepts just kind of like came together. And like, you know, at the end of the day, I think most of us have run into a scenario where like, I use this skimmer and it worked awesome. Then for some reason, the exact same skimmer doesn't, doesn't work do good anything for, Randy, for me. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and like, why is that? You know, like, why is magically Randy so bad at ah, this? It's got to be the skimmer, right? <laughs> yeah. The yeah. first thing I'm going to go to is, like, ah, it's just a, it's a piece of junk. I, I don't know yeah. what it is. And so, like, why does it, like, boil and not produce anything? Like, why, uh, you know, all these different things, man, and we have all the reasons. Uh, and I can't wait to share it with you. I won't bog you down in this conversation. But, <laughs> like, you know, we can elevate the level of information around, man, and then share it and apply it and give feedback, and the game just keeps changing. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's uh, super, super fun. Mm. Maybe we've got another couple, couple of questions here. Uh, yeah, there's quite a few. Let's see here. Uh, oh, Apex Fizz uh, hooked us up with... 10 bucks. Oh, thank so, you very much. It says, hey, Thomas, thanks for your dedication. Uh, when he left the military, he, uh, he said, you and Joey popped up, uh, and, mm -hmm. the, and that's when he started uh, fish keeping. That's awesome. So this hobby uh, saved his life, uh, and so have you. So thank you. He was always support you. There's Thank so, you so many much. people, man, in the military, man, uh, doing reefing. It's uh, yeah. amazing. Yeah, we, uh, like I, I especially when we're moving around all the time. Uh, yeah. But luckily, when I when I did, I got into it. It was my last. Well, it wasn't my last move, but it was the last time I'd have to go somewhere for an extended period of time. But even then, the the gears, uh, the gear aspect for me was so awesome because when I went to uh, Africa. Uh, I had a webcam that I could look in at any moment and look at and even move around and pan up and down and left and right so I could watch my fish while I'm you know, overseas. That's and then I'm awesome. online just buying a bunch of stuff like, stick it in the closet, I'll hook it up when I get home, just stick it here, stick it here. So I give you time to plan out and, you know, your reef and stuff. So I can see where you're coming from. That's very, very, very cool. All right, shoot another one. Uh, George Carr says, besides Harlequin shrimp, what else can clear out uh, Astrina stars? I don't know the answer to that Your question. Your hand and vacuuming, I, I was going to say good one. manual removal. <laughs> yeah. um, Asterinas are a bit of a pain. Mm. Uh, they're pretty prolific once they get going. I did, I used to service a tank that had no coral of any kind, nothing yeah. in it, just fish and a big coral insert. And the one thing that they had in droves was Asterina starfish. I could literally fill a mason jar with them, throw it away. Sorry, starfish. And then, <laughs> S -s -s that's life. Yeah. Um, and then, I'd go back in three, four weeks, and they'd all be back. Yeah. So, but yeah, harlequins are the they only made it way. Out of the I know way, of. out of the jar, and back in. No, 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 no. no <laughs> they. That would be a feat. That's like some fighting Nemo bag rolling. Yeah, yeah uh, they go really, really fast. It's and, just, yeah, so. it's just interesting. It's super awesome. I mean, it's really cool. If if you have an infestation that sucks, but it's really cool to see like when you drop a harlequin in or a pear in, that all of a sudden the stars gravitate away from them and up onto the wall they and know. I mean they know yeah, oh yeah. they know for sure that uh, terror is coming yeah. so I just watched that happen in Jeff's tank uh, so a uh -huh. uh, marketing director has a bunch of those snail or mm. uh, starfish in there and they dropped one in and you literally could see it's the amazing. waves of them going away from me like how do they know which also makes them easier to uh, get with manual removal too. So like drop a oh. harlequin in that can pick up the residual and then while they're all migrating to a corner, suck them up and get them out of it's there. It's almost like herding. I was yeah. gonna say, yeah, yeah, yeah. we got harlequin <laughs> shepherds yeah, just yeah, going around. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, very cool. <laughs> uh, what else we got here? Uh, Kevin Kim says, what is a tolerable allowance of swing and alkalinity on a daily basis? Hmm. Has a 14 gallon uh, that uh, fluctuates between 0.3 and 0.5 dkh uh, in between dosing, and is this normal? I'll let you go first. Uh, so 0.2 dkh of a swing is, to me, is probably not a big deal. Uh, All right, dude. One. Uh, not point one, like just one, one like full seven DKH to eight, point. dude. You're good. Uh, yeah, I, and that's with most people. I, I mean, I would shoot for better, but like if you're testing throughout the day, uh, like and most people are te they're dosing like 24 hours a day or mm -hmm. whatnot, and like there's definitely consuming calcium and alkalinity more during the day when the rates of photosynthesis are happening faster than at night, mm. and so like the range that you're talking about. Gold man, you're part of if, the better group. If uh, any, mm -hmm. uh, if any of us who are manually dosing uh, by hand for two part uh, have this 
are ruined by a 0.2 fluctuation in alkalinity, then there would be nobody out there without a dosing yeah. pump. Yeah, 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 exactly. Everybody would have to have a dosing pump or this wouldn't work. No, 0.2 so, is like a, a goal for me. If okay. that's all I swing, like that's that's pretty good. Keeping it perfectly stable feels like basically impossible. Yeah, I'm sure it's scientist. Not, but yeah, yeah, no, but points. Yeah, well, it's nothing. like things like the Trident now, like where you actually know you can start to adjust your dose to the times where you know, and, yeah. you know. And I will say that I can't tell you that you know, like that super tight window of alkalinity is going to produce a result. But I will tell you the mentality behind the person that is shooting for a point two. Uh, produces the best tanks, uh, no question. Mm. So the person that's shooting for that part, point two gets the best coloration, best consistent growth, best health uh, uh, of the corals. And it might be because that person is just that person, or it could be part of the stability uh, mm -hmm. of the tank, and that animals just thrive on stability. They're meticulous oh, yeah. about every other thing else, too, keeping uh, the lighting stable, the temperature stable, the, you know, all of these other parameters stable that, yeah, that's why they can produce a better tank. I would call you, uh, by the way, in uh, 0.3 to 0.5 in the uh, top probably 25% of reefers. Uh, you're getting that swing throughout the day, especially in a, in a 14 gallon tank. Mm -hmm. uh, and that stuff happens a lot faster in a small volume of water because in that case, in a small tank like that, the ratio of coral to water it is generally way, way higher than it is in a big tank. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in a big tank, there's a lot more open space and a lot more open water. And so uh, things just happen faster in a tank that size. And so you are doing really good. So you should be proud. Solid. Absolutely. Uh, Jacob Peterson, I'm going to get to some of your questions here because uh, Dave pulled a lot of them over. So let's start with, D how do you keep plastic plants clean? Hmm. Oh, I guess that one's for me. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've never had a freshwater tank. Not a plastic uh, plant guy. There's a, a couple ways. Uh, one, just making sure you don't have a ton of uh, phosphate or anything or high nitrates constantly in, in your tank is going to help. Not having your aquarium uh, freshwater tank near uh, a window so it's getting natural sunlight, that's going to elevate the amount of algae you get in the tank. Not leaving your light on all day long because most people aren't home all day. Yeah. So if you only have your light actually on for the three or four hours in the evening that you're actually going to be able mm. to enjoy your tank, that's going to help reduce the algae as well. Mm. And let's face it, ambient room light for fish is going to be enough for their circadian rhythm. They yeah. don't need more than that. Yeah. The, the light's really just for you. So that's going to help minimize how much algae you get. Now, once it's already on the plants, um, basically you can do manual removal by pulling those plants out and taking a paper towel or a brush or something and just rubbing it off the leaves pretty time consuming. Yeah. Uh, so what I generally do is I'll take a bucket of dechlorinated warm water, uh, drop all the plants in that bucket and add a cap of uh, just standard chlorine bleach. Oh yeah. Mm. Let it sit. Don't let it sit for longer than maybe 12 hours. Longer than that, you might get a little bit of discoloration of the plants. Don't use too much bleach either. Don't think more is better. Yeah. Uh, you don't want, the plants will discolor if you use too much. But uh, once you've done that, that algae basically melts away. You, Rinse off all the plants, soak them in, in a bucket of water again, but this time it's just with some extra water conditioner to get rid of any potential bleach that might be left, and then put them back in. Okay. Them back so in I don't know anything about, uh, about plastic plants, but in the salt water, we uh, often use uh, hydrogen peroxide. Mm -hmm. yeah. So does that work on a plastic plant? Uh, it, yeah, it can. The, the only thing I've found with hydrogen peroxide, and I've used that almost exclusively with live plants, because yeah. mm -hmm. you can do... Don't, don't do it, but people have done bleach, <laughs> like super weak bleach solutions okay. to try to sterilize uh, plants, but I think peroxide's a much safer way to do it. Mm. Um, I just find that it doesn't melt it off completely with a plastic plant and I end up having to rub it all off. Okay. Whereas uh, with bleach, when I, when I rinse it, just it ju it all. it's yeah. all gone. Mm. Yeah, it just comes off like, like it's mud. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. There you go. Cool. Uh, Josh Broadbent says, uh, hey Thomas, what happened to your deep dimension tank? My deep dimension tank. Did I ever have a deep dimension tank? Um, I, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. If you're talking about the Marineland 265 that I set up in uh, my home in Ontario when I was still living in Ontario, uh, that got um, got a new home. It got rehomed mm. because when I moved, it just made no sense to try to take that with me. It was going to cost way too much money to move the tank oh, yeah, from one province to another. So it went away and instead... Um, I opted to just start new tanks. So I, I gotta tell you, I'm in the same place. Uh, most of, the, a lot of people, it's really hard, man. You got, you got this tank up, it looks awesome, mm -hmm. and you wanna move it. 
uh, and like there are strategies to do this effectively, right? Especially if it's yeah. like not across to, you know the country, right? Uh, but uh, for me, most of the time, this is just a good time to get the a restart, reboot. yeah, uh, and like rehome the corals or whatnot. Maybe the people that are you know able to get them back to you at some point in time or whatnot. But there, there's something about restarting where uh, you had success the first time, and if you can restart from scratch all over again and either have better success or the same or hopefully better, uh, it's gratifying, you know? Oh, for like, sure. I, I can do this, and I can repeat it over and over and over again, which means I'm good. And I don't know anybody who set up a system and was 100% satisfied with every single choice they made on that system. No. <laughs> so it's also this really great opportunity to kind of... Uh, change any of the things that you were thinking, you know, I'd really, if I do this again, I'd really like to change such and such, whether it's how you set up the lights or what pumps you used or how you plumbed it, whatever. It's a great opportunity to kind of go through that yeah, and, and yeah. fix those, little, not even errors or mistakes, but just optimize those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, man. Uh, so I, I would say this, if you got a new tank or got a tank and you want to move, if you have been thinking about uh, like a possible upgrade in the future, just a great time to own it. If you've never thought about it and you're just so happy with the way things are going, yeah, you know, figure out how to move it. Yeah, yeah. But like, so just what group are you are in? Uh, take the plunge if you were thinking about it anyway. If you'd never thought about it, just totally happy, continue being happy. Do some research and figure out how to move it. It is possible. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, Jacob Peterson says, "What's the difference between two? What's the difference between the two Brightwell bricks?" Uh, one is just bio media, so it's just it's just ceramic media, so it's basically there for surface area. Uh, the other one is infused with uh, it's so it's a nitrogen export type block, right? So mm -hmm. probably like so sulfur material yep. or something uh, baked um, into it, mixed into it, and then infused with it, so that it does have this like nitrogen reducing type of, of effect. But that's basically they both have surf mass amounts of surface area. So if you think of like a nitrate reactor, usually it's like a way to strip off all all of the oxygen. Anoxic. Yeah, yeah. And then it creates that anoxic or bacteria that then needs like a carbon source to be able to, uh, you know, you know, process the nitrogen or mm. nitrate into nitrogen gas, right? Uh, so inside of one of those bricks, however, like all the bacteria on the outside of the brick scrub off all of the uh, oxygen fairly rapidly. And, and like many people have said, in those kinds of environments, it happens like in the first like mm -hmm. three eighths of an inch. Yeah. Wow. Very little, yeah. The bacteria just are like, so good at stripping oxygen off that it happens really, really close. And so then they have those little sulfur pellets in there uh, that are, are the like electron donor or whatever mm -hmm. for the process. Hmm. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a really neat thing. And they do wear out, by the way. So. So if you ever find like your you know nitrate is starting to rise after a year or two or whatever, uh, I don't know exactly how long they last. Yeah. It probably depends on how much nitrate you have in your tank, uh, and they just they do replace them. Swap them so, out. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the difference. Um, let's see. Raul says. Uh, is there any, so that's an addition to an original comment. He must have another one around here. Sir. Or is there any, any such thing as too much flow? Is there any, mm -hmm. su is there such thing as too much flow? I guess is a good question there. Uh, and in our, in the case of our, well, obviously there is if you have like coral tissue loss. Yeah. If, if, if flesh is falling off of your corals, uh, or you just, uh, or your fish just hide the corner all the time, I don't know. Maybe uh, some fish can't handle a high energy reef, then uh, they have too much flow. Uh, sand, if you have a sand bed and it's blowing around all over the place, yeah, probably too much flow. Or reposition it. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I basically fully agree. Yeah. Too, too much flow can happen. I think it's harder to achieve than most people think it is. Mm. I think um, we've, we've come to realize in the hobby our corals can handle a lot more flow than we've been letting up. But I think it also has to do with, like, I'm sure you remember back when you started reefing, all we had was, like, unidirectional power heads that pumped a tight, like a laser beam of water at the uh, at the corals and either that had to itself move. No, dude, I was yeah, using the, the, super the hydro, swirls. hydro rotating guy. Man, I was yeah. way past you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there you go. So like, but now that we have these pumps that can push massive amounts of water without mm. it being so directional, uh, the corals are really starting to benefit. If you think about like, just watch a diver on any reef, mm -hmm. any shallow reef especially, 
and watch them here, and then two seconds later, they're, yeah. you know... Having to hold on. Yeah, and, yeah. 40 feet away. Mm -hmm. How much water just moved past those corals, right? Yeah. If it could carry that person that far. So obviously they, they can, but you're right. If you're blowing stuff around, maybe it could just be a placement issue. But... Yeah, yeah. I, I would say if you can't see a visual problem, then uh, it's just fine. Like yeah. any sign of too much flow, you'll see with the naked eye. It, oh, yeah. It, like, it will look like an unhealthy animal. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and it's just skin's blown off of it, right? Uh, <laughs> so, like, I, I snorkel and stuff. And so, like, I often, like, try to pay attention to, like, what's happening uh, while I'm snorkeling. So, uh, like, I like, can try to recreate that in my tank. And a lot of, often what I'll see is the effect of the waves. And so the waves will pound water, you know, in inshore. Mm -hmm. And you can watch it. Like, the corals are just kind of, like, looking like this. There's a current, you know, mm -hmm. that is kind of going like this. And then eventually there's so much water on shore that it needs to leave, right? And then it starts coming back out, but the water's still coming in, and so now you see turbulence, right? And so now they're going like this, but eventually <laughs> the water wins going back out. And then and they're going this way, yeah. right? Uh, <laughs> we should so, create a dance yeah. out of it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> if, if you watch turbulence. long enough, you can kind of watch the, like, uh, how it happens. And mm -hmm. like, I I've actually watched it just sitting on the beach too, man. I can watch like, where the water is going. You know, yeah. and, and it comes in, and you can see kind of it, it swells to a point, and then it needs to break somewhere. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and like, so I don't think you can have enough flow or too much flow unless the eye sees it. But one of the things that, like, you know, people get super hung up on is like 30x, 50x, 100x, 10x, oh, yeah. whatever. Put All that stuff is it. like garbage, yeah. man. Uh, I, I, like, it's hard because everybody wants to know the number, right? But it's really actually garbage. Mm -hmm. So, like, what you got to look at is in the tank, where are the dead spots? Because even though I have like, you know, 50x flow shooting here, you know, behind that rock over here, it's like 2x. Yeah. You know, like, and like in the middle of the tank in the back, it's 1x. You know, so how can I add flow so I'm getting 10x everywhere? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like par. So in the past, like you were, people were testing par, and they're yep. like in the middle, it's 500, <laughs> but like you know, six inches over, it's 100. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that could that's enough, not going to help. What yeah. we're looking for is like you know, 200 to 300 in as much of the tank as possible. Mm. Spread that thing out. So you know, 50x right here, laser beams hitting each other, no good. Uh, but can we like start putting them in different places, like? More less powerful pumps in the right places, mm. best results. Mm -hmm. uh, Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. All right. Awesome. Uh, Dylan's Den says, uh, are there are there definitive tests that show lava rock be uh, is detrimental to a mixed reef tank? Um, and again, gives an example. My 55 gallon has been up for over seven months, completely scaped with lava rock. Corals are growing and fish are good. Well, so in this case, uh, oh, I'll, I'll, do you have any opinions on lava rock? For a reef tank? I, I've never personally used lava rock in a reef setting. I've mm -hmm. only ever used it in fresh water. So I'm not really sure. My, my mind immediately goes to what is lava rock like fundamentally made out of? Mm -hmm. Is there going to be extra, uh, any, any metals in it, any other minerals mm -hmm. that are, you know, potentially going to cause issues for, for sessile invertebrates or yeah. any invertebrates for that matter? So I don't really know uh, how it would work. Have you guys used? Never used rock, lava rock. Lava rock? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't so even know if Let's I've get it under one. a spectron microscope and rip it apart like, and find ICP out what it's made of. Soak it in water and get some ICP tests, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. So before I ever like put a tank based on this, uh, I would go and I, I, you know, ICP now is like 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. right? It's probably even cheaper. Ah, there's, yeah. There's so something. like, you know, just go out and soak it in a bucket of water and test whether or not metals are coming out of it because lava comes out of the ground. It's molten metal and all kinds of other stuff that's mm. coming out of the ground. The, most of the rock that we're using is calcium carbonate based, which is the same base as what the coral's actually made out of, yep. right? So there's, just because it's rock doesn't make it rock. And so lava rock, there's no, I can't tell you it's bad or anything. I just got concerns. And the different thing is like, like the lava rock you buy at like a Home Depot or whatnot, yeah. doesn't look like anything like the lava fields uh, in Hawaii or right. whatnot, right? So, right. And like, you know, what pocket did that volcano, you know, How did they that clean day? it yeah. before they send it out? Yeah. yeah. So. I mean, you walk the fields and, and see how that is like it got metallic sheen to it. And over there, it's a totally different color. It's different minerals and stuff. In right. It. Mm. So I don't think there is a generic answer to that. In fact, you can go to the beaches and like some of the beaches are green. 
because the lava was green during that millennia or whatever, mm -hmm. right? And some of them were black and some were... So, like, uh... It'd be interesting to see uh, if over time it had leached something. Like, wherever you get your their, your lava rock from. You, if I started a tank with lava rock and it, it's doing awesome for, like, a, you know, seven, seven... This one's been up for seven months. Maybe you get a year out of it. Maybe you get two years out of it. But then weird things start happening in the tank and you don't know how long it took for those things, whatever was in the lava rock, to break down and start affecting the tank. So that said, uh, uh, before we're like all alarmist that a lava ah, yeah. rock is bad, uh, I will tell you, tons and tons and tons of people use that black sand, yeah. which is lava. There you go. Right? <laughs> now it's lava that has been, you know, uh, pulverized into little teeny bits over a millennia mm -hmm. on the beach and then collected. So it's cured uh, for a thousand years, probably, mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's lava that came out of the ground, you know? So, I don't know, you know? I, I've heard people, like, run magnets and over over the uh, the black lava sand before, and, like, it'll pick little pieces up. Doesn't mean it's bad, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, we put iron, which is magnetic, in our tanks all mm -hmm. the time in form of GFO. Yep. Yeah. You know, so, like, metal doesn't mean bad. It's just scary. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. I don't know. A black rock, a black sand is cool though, in in its own way. Yeah, it hides a lot. I, I feel a, a a BRS video coming out soon. Like, that, uh, that, that, that tests test unconventional, just uh, any unconventional any rock, tougher Very, rock, live rock. You know, put Texas it all to the test. Holy. Well, Texas holy. There yeah. you go. Okay, so rock is totally different now. Like the conversation, you know, we used to say dry rock, dead rock, whatever, mm -hmm. live rock. Well, you can still have the debate if you want, but there's no more live rock. Yeah, you, you get can't it. buy it anymore. And if you if you can, it's from really specific spots. Yeah. that somebody's got a super secret line on, mm -hmm. and it's 15 bucks a pound. Yeah. And yeah. like, it's super super expensive yeah. and hard to find. B uh, business idea for those of you down in the warmer climates: take some reef saver rock and turn it live for people. Yeah, 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 dude. Like somebody's gonna do that yeah. sooner or later. And there's people that do it like by dropping it in the ocean, but like. I can tell you, I bought rock that way, my first tank, actually. You get some cool stuff, though. It oh, was yeah. the coolest <laughs> way to start, man, but, like, there were so many mantis shrimps. I was just going to say uh, mantis shrimps. And, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Every time. And, I, and in the end, I spent all this time trying to catch all the mantis shrimp, and I don't know why I did, because they were actually cool. I'd rather just feed them snails. Yeah. Because uh, they were really, really neat, yeah. actually. Uh, and, uh, like, but... There was also like these uh, parasitic isopods that would like attach to my fish mm, and stuff. Yeah. Like yeah. so, you know, the stuff comes out of the ocean, man. It was shipped in water, so like everything was alive. I've mm -hmm. heard of people getting octopus. Actually, yeah, the buttfish. Yeah, yeah dude, my buddy that came in here, uh, and he's like, dude, I just cycled a tank, man, and a fish appeared out of nowhere. I get a fish hitchhiker in my rock, and I'm like. What, dude? How, how a fish doesn't live in the rock, man? And it was. I was like, wait, wait, wait. Did you put a cucumber in there? And he's like, yeah. And you got a buttfish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Parasitic cucumber buttfish. Yeah. yeah, dude. I'm like, I like. Oh my god, I never. <laughs> I've heard of people getting that, but I've never met anybody. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, so for those you know, there are uh, fish that lives inside of cucumbers' butts, uh, <laughs> and you can get one uh, as a hitchhiker on uh, your rock. Uh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, we, well, I mean, getting back to what you were saying, the the rock selection's limited. They're so very it would be interesting to you know find out what other things we could use. Yeah, and so like get people to uh, take uh, either the mine stuff or the artificial, and mm -hmm. the artificial stuff is getting way better, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah, the first stuff I saw, uh, you know, like the real reef stuff. Now we just I just used it for the first time actually. Yeah. You know, I've seen it used around the office, but myself I used it for the first time. Like this stuff's actually really nice, and mm -hmm. it's it's dyed, and so it looks like the right color purple from the beginning. Mm -hmm. The edges of it are really nice, uh, and. You know, before a lot of people were using like uh, epoxy and stuff, and the epoxy kind of like flakes off over yeah. time and kind of undesirable. So this is a way way better approach. And I was looking at it like, hmm. You know, you look at this stuff, the the dyed stuff with the uh, uh, the real reef, and then like some of the other ones that have epoxy on it. Like, they look about the same day one. But I prefer to not have flaking epoxy in here, and yeah. I will pay an extra fifty cents a pound to not have that happen. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. I don't know. Funny enough, my next tank, I'm gonna try that real reef stuff. So I'm glad to hear. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so where I got, I got like, 
you know, really entices a lot of people were, were like Terrence was telling me, like he builds out, Terrence from Neptune, he builds out his uh, Aquascape, and then normally like you just gotta fill it with coral and you're kinda done, right? Mm -hmm. Then what he does is once you're full, is he gets a branch piece and then sticks it in the side and the branches come out and now you can put all kinds of more Acupora uh, on the branch. And I'm like, that's genius. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, like, adding oh, real estate after the fact. Yeah, like that's almost impossible. You know, like uh, to rebuild your Aquascape, but like, when you think about it in the beginning, the aquascape is your tank, right? But after the thing's all set up, you can't even see the rock anymore. Yeah. Right? The corals is your aquascape. Yeah. And then yeah. he's like, dude, and, and it's actually perfect for this because the corals become the aquascape. Mm -hmm. And because there's so little rock actually there, there's so much flow that goes through True. the corals yeah. uh, instead mm -hmm. of getting like stuck by the rock. I'm like, that's brilliant. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll be interested to hear how, how it goes for you, uh, and uh, like consider the little branch technique is somewhere. In I there. like it. Yeah, right Two now. branches. Uh, we'll answer. Oh, we went over here actually. So he, he does have to have a flight to get out of here pretty soon. So let's answer like three more, okay. and uh, we'll wrap her up here. And uh, I do have an administrative note after two. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, let's take a look here. Rossby Reefin says, I've recently heard some rumors of dry rocks from natural sources leach PO4 for an extended period of time after being reintroduced to salt water. Is this fact or fiction? I get an opinion uh, on this one. I think it's true. Uh, like, so we used to get the Fiji and the Pukanis and stuff like that. And uh, I mean, the stuff is harvested and then dried, you know, harvested from the ocean, then dried. So tons of organics, tons of organics deep in the pores uh, that you can't even see or get to. Uh, it doesn't even have to be like the small pores, the really large open holes that you can drill through. And uh, you know, you can see that the, the porosity is all the way through. If you drill a hole through, you can see just how dense that, you know, how not very dense that uh, inside is, uh, which I think just can probably hold organics for a long time. Uh, I found this that that uh, to be the case. There's, uh, I, in fact, I found weirder stuff even. Uh, and so, like, we would, you know, bleach the the like pukani and stuff like that. That was, oh, you know, old school yeah, coral yeah, skeleton. Yeah, yeah. And we would get it all that way down to zero, and then it would go back up to point two, right? Mm. But it'd stay at point two, and then we'd get it all the water out there, and then go to. Point, I can't remember if it was point zero two or point two, but mm. it would get up Register. back up to where uh, to a level, and it would stay there. It wouldn't go any higher. Uh, and so, like, there's some kind of solubility thing here, maybe. Like, uh, it is dissolving some of the uh, phosphate out of the rock. It's I'm well, wondering, really, but, like, it would go to it would never if you could leave it, it wouldn't go to point four yeah. ever. Uh, but as soon as you got it back, just do a hundred percent water change, go down to zero, it go back to point two. Uh, so it's got to come from somewhere. Yeah. I mean, interesting. It's also interesting how how much mass we lost after oxidizing with like bleach, mm. uh, like obviously. Oh, the acid. Yeah, the acid. Well, the especially especially with the acid, mm. but uh, or the combination of the both. But I mean, obviously, it was eating up some kind of organics, and mm. if you can lose like thirty percent of your rock mass. So the other part of this, though, is so the mined stuff, uh, like the Marco rocks and mm. stuff. And people I've heard of, like you know, a million times say, like, oh, this is leaching phosphate in my tank. The flip side of that is I have personally soaked that stuff for months, like so many times over the years, and then tested it to make sure, like, is it, are you getting any reading? Double zeros. Mm. So I have never once ever got a reading out of curing uh, that rock that I, I don't know. And so part of the thing is, like, I don't think people have a total concept. They're like, well, where my, where's my PO4 come from then? Well, you're dumping it in every day with food, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to stop feeding. And, the, and it isn't good enough to actually to stop feeding because, like, the fish, all right, even if you stop feeding today, the fish are actually still going to excrete it into the water, mm -hmm. right? And if you stop feeding, they'll just consume themselves. Like, uh, you know, animals just consume their own tissue uh, when you stop feeding them. So, uh, like... Uh, even the, if you, like like little crabs and stuff that are starving in the tank oh, are going to do that too. So, uh, but I, in my experience, the the mine stuff, at least from the sources that we're getting it from, like never ever. Uh, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been like a pocket somewhere someday that had that in there. But mm -hmm. I don't know. But the live stuff that is an organic, you know, coral at one point in time, and the same thing actually with uh, coral media too, right? So like when your calcium reactor? Oh, uh, true, yeah. The calcium, uh, even, well, it's the limestone stuff. It had phosphates in it. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously the live, or the, 
dead coral skeleton bits mm -hmm. that were pieces of right. coral were in the ocean have phosphates in them after especially if you're dissolving them with CO2 and like you're getting them down to nothing but fine grit uh, you're, you're getting, whatever phosphate they were holding on to is now yeah going whatever is down inside of yeah. it is just getting released as you break it apart I mean you hope and pray for like all of the trace elements you'll ever meet ever need eh, maybe it's not as diverse of trace element dosing uh, as actually like a, a system of liquids, but uh, I mean, there's some in there to some degree. So that was an interesting thing, like when we went to Worldwide Corals and they were like, yeah, so we don't really have a problem with nitrate, but phosphate eventually gets up and like we use the phosphate E, you know, and they like to dose it so they can, you know, not just strip it all out, but mm -hmm. control uh, with precipitation. Uh, and so, like, I'm like, well, why would they have such a phosphate problem, but not a nitrate problem? And then it's because all of the tanks are running calcium reactors, right? And when I say problem, it's not a problem if you just use the, like, you know, they're using that Brightwell phosphate E. And I hadn't actually seen anybody use that before, mm -hmm. uh, but it works. After they told you how, to, how it works, you know, and, and why you'd use it is I don't want double zeros. Yeah. I actually want to just dose it. And we know on these tanks, if I dose five milliliters, it reduces at 0 0.02 each time. And I made that number up. But like they have a specific mm -hmm. number and it just works. And I'm like, well, that's a great way to control this and you know manage the fact that the calcium reactor media when you melt it is melting organic uh, you know source and it is going to add phosphate to the system. Mm. Like, but it, in today's age, there's so many ways to deal with phosphate. Is that even a problem? I don't know. I yeah. don't it's hard so. to say. Yeah. Uh, it is if it's uncontrolled and you don't have a way to deal with it. Right. But yeah, to answer your question about rock. For sure, uh, and I'm gonna say that I don't see a scenario where old, like general live rock isn't doing the same thing. Because general live rock, you know, is just old organic dead thing too. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't think there's anything that really defines whether or not it was dried or live. And, and what live means, by the way, is 90% uh, of the cases, it was taken out of the ocean, set in holding for two weeks at some place, entered a boat that took a month-long boat ride to LA and sat in a holding place there for two weeks before it was shipped to you. So, uh, live and damp, or <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like kind of the same thing, kind of not. So I don't know, I think any rock came out of the ocean is probably going to have some of that. Uh, and it's hard to identify because you are adding it every day with fish food, so you know it's hard to tell. So, all right, so we're going to have to wrap this up, so we've got to get you on a plane, man. But yeah. thank you very much for coming out. My pleasure. Uh, nice meeting uh, you. Uh, Come uh, here. Uh, uh. For those of you who don't know, uh, the reason that he is here <laughs> actually is because he gave a super awesome tip on uh, the Cato reactor. And yeah. He said, hit me up. I talked to him the other day, yep. and I'm like, hey, hey, dude, that was super cool. You know what? We have an opening, and if you want to come and talk to us live, and he's like, bam, I'm here. And yeah, so, like, it got on a plane like the next day to come on down. Yeah. So, thank you very much, yeah. man. Oh, awesome. Awesome. It's my pleasure. Good to see you. And uh, we'll see all of you uh, next week. And you know who oh, we have we, next uh, week? We have uh, Elliot. Elliot from Marine Collector. So, a lot of you have heard me talk about him is a, a source for fish for all of us. He's going to come down. I don't know exactly what we're going to talk about, but you can ask fish. all kinds of questions quarantine. about fish and quarantining and all kinds of different things. Uh, meet the guy that we've been talking about for all this time. So uh, Elliot will be here next week, and uh, we'll see you guys all next week. See you guys.